Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Dana McQueen on today's show. Welcome, Dana. Hi, how are you? The title of today's show is Recurrent Pregnancy Loss. I'm extremely excited to have you on today to talk about exactly that. Let me share a little bit with our listeners about you. You're a reproductive endocrinologist and board certified OBGYN at Reproductive Medicine Associates, RMA, one of the nation's leading reproductive science providers and a pioneer in IVF research. You joined RMA after a fellowship at Northwestern and practicing at University of Chicago. While Dr. McQueen's expertise covers the full range of reproductive endocrinology and infertility care, your research focuses on risk factors for recurrent pregnancy loss and pregnancy outcomes after IVF. Well, welcome back, Dr. McQueen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Since your last show with us here, what advancements or new insights have emerged in understanding the causes of miscarriage, especially in cases of recurrent pregnancy loss? The most common cause of a pregnancy loss is going to be a chromosome error within the pregnancy itself. But there's many other causes of pregnancy loss, and there's a lot of active research going on to figure out what could be causing couples to have multiple miscarriages, or RPL. One of the things that came out more recently is that we really need to understand the male component and the male contribution to pregnancy loss. There's some evidence that sperm DNA fragmentation is related to recurrent pregnancy loss. And the American Neurologic Society put out a new guideline on infertility in conjunction with ASRM. And in that guideline, it says that couples with recurrent pregnancy loss, the male partner should be tested for sperm DNA fragmentation. And so it's sort of that doctors are starting to do when they work up um, RPL. And that's huge because I think so much of the male side is ignored. How can someone get their sperm DNA fragmentation checked? If you go to a fertility physician, they can order a semen analysis and a sperm DNA fragmentation test. You can also get this test through ReproSource and they can send it directly to you, but I believe you still need an ordering doctor. So usually it's a fertility physician who's seeing both the partners in a couple that will order the test. Yeah. There's also another consumer direct source and that's Legacy. They have a kit that they can ship to your home. That's one easy way for patients to access that test who let's say may not have a physician that is up to date on the latest research and quote unquote, don't believe that sperm DNA fragmentation can make a difference. So I appreciate all the work that you've done. Let's talk about chronic endometritis. It is also often under discussed when it comes to miscarriage. Can you explain the relationship between chronic endometritis and miscarriage? And I want to point out that we're not talking about endometriosis, which is completely different. And I think often those terms get swapped by patients where they think that when we're talking about endometritis, we're actually talking about endometriosis and we're not. How can this condition affect future pregnancies? Chronic endometritis is one of the main things that I studied when I was looking at recurrent pregnancy loss and its causes and trying to figure out what else we could figure out about women who have recurrent miscarriages. And one of the things we found is that women with recurrent pregnancy loss have a much higher rate of this inflammation inside their uterus. And we call it chronic endometritis. It doesn't necessarily have any symptoms. Sometimes it can cause some spotting or pelvic pain, but usually really no symptoms at all. And we find that in a biopsy of the lining of the uterus, there's a lot of plasma cells. And that's a type of white cell that moves into the lining when there's inflammation there. And so this is actually easily treated with antibiotics. And so most women, when you treat with antibiotics, the next biopsy is going to be negative. And we think that it's related to miscarriages and actually probably infertility too, where there's this sort of hostile environment in the uterus that is not accepting a a pregnancy or the pregnancy starts to grow, it's not able to grow normally. And so we think that treating it will improve sort of live birth rates down the road. And what kind of tests should a patient ask for? Is it just simply an endometrial biopsy? Is there something more to it that they should be asking for? So it's an endometrial biopsy. We often do it at the same time as either a saline ultrasound or a hysteroscopy that you're doing in the office. And then the pathologist that receives the sample will do some special staining. And the staining is called CD138. It's just a marker on the specific type of cell. And so when you stain for it, you can easily see these cells in the sample and diagnose chronic endometritis. Beautiful. There's a couple other commercial tests that will look for chronic endometritis. So if you're doing a receptiva, for example, they may also look for it. But you can ask your doctor for a CD138 chronic endometritis test and they should know what that is. 
Exactly. And one of the tests I also do is that are the Emma and Alice tests that look at the microbiome and specifically at the different uterine pathogens. So I definitely agree with this approach. And I definitely diagnose patients, both patients who have had transfers, for example, that didn't work, and then patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. Sometimes it causes patients to spiral because they often think that there's something dirty about them and maybe they blame their partners for the same issue. So have you ever had that experience where patients sometimes panic and feel like maybe this is sexually transmitted? Patients have asked me about it. We really don't think it's sexually transmitted. I mean, really, we think that it's coming from sort of abnormalities within the uterus. Probably, I think it's coming from having miscarriages. You know, I think it's probably a chicken and the egg kind of situation where you have a miscarriage, maybe there's some retained pregnancy tissue, maybe some inflammation develops, and then you get chronic endometritis that impairs your ability to have a live birth in the future. So I don't think it's caused by your partner. I think it's probably, you know, either random or caused by some inflammatory event inside the uterus. You guys heard it here first. Your husband's not cheating on you. And so do you treat the partner when you have a diagnosis like this in a patient of yours? I don't. Most doctors I've talked to do not, but there are some doctors that will treat the partner. I don't think it's detrimental to treat them, but I don't think you need to. For patients navigating pregnancy after a loss, what practical guidance do you offer to help them through the emotional and medical complexities of this experience? Going through recurrent pregnancy loss is really difficult. It's difficult physically for the things that you have to go through, and then it's really difficult emotionally for both partners. Often patients rely on each other as their support system, but they're both grieving at the same time. So I think finding a good support system, whether it's your partner or family or friend that can, you can talk to about it um, is really important. I usually recommend that my patients see a therapist as part of the process, because if you have a good therapist who's working with you, they can help give you pro coping strategies. And those strategies can help you deal with the next miscarriage if there is one or the anxiety that comes with a new pregnancy. Because if we're going to try again, that next pregnancy is going to be really difficult. You're going to have to get through that first trimester. And having a therapist or really good support person is going to be really essential. Absolutely. And are there any new approaches or treatments available that offer hope for improving outcomes in these difficult cases? Yeah, I mean, that's the hard part. So recurrent pregnancy loss research has been a little far and far between. So there aren't huge reproductive studies going on with recurrent pregnancy loss for the most part. And I think it's sad because we really should focus on this as an area of study. The most recent guideline from ASRM, which is a sort of big society that we work with, came out in 2012. And so it's been a long time, over 10 years since we had a new guideline on how to manage recurrent pregnancy loss. So we're really pushing for them to make a new guideline. It's in the works. I read it and they're editing it. And um, I hope that it comes out in the next year. I think the newest things are going to be that DNA fragmentation that we talked about. I think it, this chronic endometritis is going to be a newer thing and definitely both will at least be mentioned, if not recommended in the guideline, I think. And then there are some new sort of NIH funded studies. One, there's one that's happening at Stanford, and I believe Yale is another site of a similar study. They're looking at genetic factors of miscarriage. So not a whole chromosome that's extra or missing, but instead like genes that might cause miscarriage. So they're analyzing the genetics of the mother, the father, and the embryo. So if you have a miscarriage, they can look at all three, compare them, it's called TRIO study, and then they can see if there's a gene that's causing the loss. And that's going to be really interesting. It's a big informatics study. They're sending their data to these data scientists to go through huge volume of data. But that could be interesting in the next couple of years, I think. Many of our patients have both diminished ovarian reserve alongside recurrent pregnancy loss. How do you approach fertility preservation options for those who may also want to consider egg freezing? Yeah, I think that's it's really interesting, right? So we know the increased risk of miscarriage is mostly from chromosome abnormalities inside eggs. And so as we age, there's a much higher risk of miscarriage compared to when we were younger. And so by doing fertility preservation with egg freezing, you know, you may have the opportunity to lower your risk of miscarriage in the future. We haven't done a study yet, I don't think, that looks at egg freezing patients and if they have a lower rate of recurrent pregnancy loss. But we know that when we do an embryo transfer and someone gets pregnant and that embryo is tested with PGTA, which means you know, genetic testing of the chromosomes, the miscarriage risk is going to be lower in that pregnancy compared to a pregnancy that happened naturally at the same age. So there's going to be a reduction in miscarriage if we know the pregnancy is chromosomally normal. And probably if you're freezing eggs in the future, you'd be testing those embryos 
and seeing if they're normal. It's just so hard for patients who've had recurrent pregnancy loss and then they're pregnant again. The anxiety that they feel as they're pregnant is overwhelming. How do you empower them to regain confidence and hope when they're either pregnant or when they're ready to continue their fertility journey after a diagnosis of recurrent pregnancy loss? When patients come for their first consult, oftentimes they've been through many miscarriages. Maybe some of those miscarriages were sort of dismissed or they were told, okay, they were too early or biochemical, they don't count. And so patients hopefully find that in our consult, in our first consult, they're able to get a lot of validation for what's happened to them and really understand you know, the whole story that the doctor's actually listening to their whole story of where they've been. And then I think it helps. And I think in that first visit, you're able to establish sort of a trust because you're going through all the different pregnancies that they've had and all the different treatment options and all the things that could cause miscarriage. And a lot of patients, I think, leave that first visit with some hope. They say, okay, I haven't tested everything. There's more things to test. We haven't tried all these different treatments and there's more things to treat. And so I think that first visit is able to instill some feeling of control and hope for the next pregnancy. So I want to talk a little bit about that though. Um, Do you think that there's a connection between endometriosis and recurrent pregnancy loss? This is an area I think that should be studied also more frequently. There is evidence that endometriosis is linked to miscarriages. And when patients have recurrent implantation failure, where we've transferred several embryos and we're not getting implantation, one of the tests we often do is to look for endometriosis with a receptiva test. And then we find that there's higher pregnancy rates and better outcomes when we use Lupron to suppress endometriosis. I think there's probably a connection with early pregnancy loss as well. I don't, it's not in the guidelines now that you should check everybody for endometriosis, but those guidelines came out well before the receptiva test was even available. And certainly you wouldn't want to do a major surgery on everyone if you don't need to, to look for endometriosis. So hopefully with some of these newer tests for it, we can start to figure out what, what associations there are and, and how we can treat endometriosis and still try to get pregnant. And that's the difficulty because to treat endometriosis, you have to suppress it with Lupron. So if you're not doing IVF, makes it harder to conceive, obviously. But if you are doing IVF, it might be a preferred transfer protocol. Yeah. Also with adenomyosis, we know that there's an increased risk of miscarriage, and that's often seen in patients who have endometriosis. So I think adenomyosis can often go undiagnosed for patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. So it's important to talk to your doctor about whether you have that as well. Yeah. So thank you for that. What role does IVF play for patients who have experienced recurrent miscarriage? And how does your approach to IVF differ for those with a history of pregnancy loss versus those who don't have that history? So IVF for recurrent miscarriage is really a debated topic. And there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial. And that means there hasn't been a study where half the patients did IVF, half the patients tried naturally, and then we saw what the miscarriage rate or the live birth rate was. So we have to extrapolate all these different studies and other data to figure out if IVF would be helpful. And so it's not perfect. I do think that in some patients, IVF with genetic testing is going to improve your chance of having a baby. And the reason is because we know that chromosome abnormalities cause miscarriage. We know that that increases with age. And so in patients that are a little bit older, who have a good egg supply, if you could get enough embryos where you could test them and see if you have normal embryos, it's definitely going to be better to transfer a chromosomally normal embryo compared to trying on your own. So that is a a portion of the population that I think could really benefit. Patients that have a very low egg supply where they're not going to get an embryo, they do IVF, or they may just get one embryo or a couple eggs, you know, I think those patients may benefit from just trying on their own because you do lose some time by doing several IVF cycles that don't work. Whereas with natural conception, you just need one egg per month to try. There is a risk though, that if you do that, there could be another miscarriage because you're not testing the embryos chromosomally. So if a patient says, I can't handle another miscarriage and they really want to minimize the rate, then IVF with PGTA is probably better for that person. Knowing that still, when you transfer a normal embryo, the risk of miscarriage is probably around 12%, even if it's deployed. So there's still a risk of miscarriage, but it's lower. In patients that are super young, so someone that comes to you at 38 years old or 25 years old who's had two miscarriages, I think probably IVF is not the most effective treatment for them because they most likely aren't having chromosomally abnormal miscarriages. And we know that when we get a lot of embryos for IVF and we test them for genetic testing, 
by around 85% of the embryos in someone who's really young are going to be normal. And so it's probably not the main cause of miscarriages for them. Lastly, for listeners experiencing recurrent miscarriage, what is one piece of advice or encouragement you would like them to take away from today's conversation? The most important thing is that you, you should have hope. Most patients with recurrent pregnancy loss go on to have a baby. Most of them actually go on to have a baby in the very next pregnancy. Doing a full workup is definitely recommended. So looking at the uterus, looking at your hormones, checking antiphospholipid antibodies and chronic endometritis, this all gives us some information. And if we're able to treat it, we will. But even if they don't find something, most pregnancies will be a success. And so just to have hope that you can do it and um, the resilience to try again, I think is my main you know, take home point. Beautiful. And where can people find you? So I'm at RMA in Northern California. So I have my offices in San Francisco. And so you can find me here. You can find me on the internet by going to Instagram. Thank you, Dana, for joining us. 